Well, this week on Outside the Vines, it is a Bordeaux bonanza. We are going global with our wines and our sports. Tonight, the all-time leading scorer in the history of Pac-12 men's basketball, the incomparable Don McClain, stops by with some thoughts on everything from college hoops to cabs. And since we're talking Bordeaux this week, what a thrill to have Ted Robinson joining us from Paris. Yes, he's been covering the French Open for the Tennis Channel, so I'm sure he'll have something fantastic opened from the Bordeaux region. Looking forward to hearing from him. Uh, for Glenn Parker, Don, and myself, our Bordeaux blend, We'll be from the state of Washington. We'll taste a 2015 Rasa Creative Impulse. This wine has never received anything lower than a 92 point rating in its nine year history. And this 2015 comes in at 94 points. So we'll see if that rating stacks up to what Glenn Parker thinks. You know, he can be picky. If you love sports that have a net, this is the episode for you. For the love of wine and the thirst for sports, this is Outside the Vines. Cheers. All right. Well, we are back. And I just want to say, gentlemen, uh, before we start, Ted is joining us from his hotel room in Paris at 1 a.m. local time. Is that right, Ted? 1 a.m. OK, your commitment is commendable. Uh, certainly better than mine. Now Robinson, of course. But I was going to say I knew there was no way you were going to miss a chance to drink wine with Don oh. McClain. So it's no, no surprise. No, I mean, come on, Ash, you and I. We we're, we're, we're going to have to really swing our weight here because you're dealing with Captain Cab here, Don McLean, and our own Parker. My God, we've got two experts in our own Pac-12 family here. So I'm just glad I have a full bottle of wine to drink and sit back and listen yeah. to the three of you for the next hour, because that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, Don, I, one thing before I, I let Ted take it over, and we actually start talking a little bit of wine. I think a lot of people, they know you obviously as the guy who scored more points than anyone in the history of the Pac-12, but I'm guessing a lot of people may not know how much of a wine guy you are. I didn't know until I randomly got invited to a pandemic, you know, virtual happy hour last summer and Don's holding court talking about cabs, like he's some grandmaster Psalm. And I just, I was kind of blown away. So I, I just, I, I want to ask you one thing before we start, Don, have you, have you forgiven our producer, Adam Gordon, for not asking you to be a host on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not okay. quite yet. You're still working through that. I, I must tell the listeners off the bat, and you people that know me know I have some weird, quirky stuff that <laughs> literally I only drink caps and some blend. So let's establish that first, that I'm just a one-trick pony. Uh, but I do love wine. I probably don't know as much about wine as you guys on this show. But I do like to drink it, and I do and have been for a while. So I've gotten to know it. Um, but yeah, let, let's, I guess what I'm saying, Ash, is let's not get too broad spectrum on, in the wine thing. Cause I only know one, I only know one type. Yeah. I, can I just interject here? I don't think any of us know all that much, Don. We just like it a lot like you. And let's face it. If you, if you like what you're drinking, you're winning at this game. That's right. That's the right. best part about wine. Yeah. So Don, who put the, who put a glass in your hand for the first time and said, yeah, you have to try this. So I, I had had a little wine throughout the years, but when I when I was almost done playing, I got to know a friend. I live in Westlake Village out here in California, and I got to know a guy that owns a couple restaurants on the lake in Westlake. And so we were old golfing buddies. We played golf all the time. And so the more time I started spending with him, the more wine I started drinking. And the nice part about being friends with him is you get all your wine from the wholesalers at their cost. And so throughout the years, um, you know, whether it's uh, a certain wineries blowing out their vintage and they're deep discounting it, but just the regular pricing of it is I've got my hands on a lot of great wines for a lot less than retail. And so that's where it started. And it's basically continued for the last, I don't know, 20 years, 18 years, something like that. And, and so he's been a great friend and, and, and he's the one that kind of introduced me to the really good stuff. You know, I didn't know what was good wine and what wasn't, but when I started tasting the good stuff, you know, when it's the good stuff. Yeah. Can, hey, Doug, can I ask you what, do you remember what that first bottle was you had that you went, Whoa, this is so much different than what I've been having. 
Do you remember that? Oh, no, that's a good question, Glenn. It, I, I, I don't know exactly which bottle it was, but I just remember, you know, it's in that group of high-end cabs, the Camuses, the Silver Oaks, the, those types that you just were like, wow. And I love to eat steaks too. And so that's what really, really started. It was, you know, eating red meat with steak. And that's what everyone's done for years and years. And I just love that concept and I love the taste. And so what better way to start drinking wine than order a steak or make a steak here, which I do quite often. What was the reaction your first Chardonnay? Well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> My actually, my wife is a big white wine drinker, so oh. she gets into her white wine. I'm the red, she's the white. But I, I'll be honest, I haven't drank hardly any white wine. When I say that I only drink the cabs and blends, like literally, that's all I drink. <laughs> but Ted, you know me, man. I got some weird stuff going. I can talk hoops. I can talk wine. That's it. Hey, and only one type of wine. All right. So, so let, let's do something here because we're going to get back to the wines because we're, we're all, since we're in different locations, as Ash said, we're, we're drinking different wines, but you just finished a heck of a basketball game and the team that you covered during the regular season, the Clippers, the pro team, just, I mean, what was, first of all, I, I, has it ever happened? I, I didn't get privy to the records out here. Has any playoff series like that had six straight road wins? No. First time it's no. happened. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was a great series. In fact, you know, Dallas, I think Utah is a better matchup for the Clippers than Dallas was. This Doncic kid, Doncic kid is unbelievable. And he was a tough cover. They struggled covering him the entire series. But Kawhi kind of stepped up in game six, and they did enough yesterday making threes to, to move on. But it ain't going to be easy winning an NBA championship this year, that's for sure. So who do you think is going to win it, Don? I mean, I like the Clippers now coming out of the West. I think the road now with the Lakers out of the way, that that was the one team that everybody wanted to avoid just because you thought that they were going to get healthier. Turns out they got less healthy and lost in the first round. But I think the Clippers are the favorite now in the West. And, you know, Brooklyn, we'll see how long Harden's out. But I, I, I like the team coming out of the West, whether it's the Clippers or somebody else, to, to win it this year. So if you're, if, you're, if you're saying that, let's just go to this next series – what are the key takeaways? What are the things that a person like myself loves basketball, but I don't follow it closely? What are the takeaways for me watching watching the Clippers and the Jazz? Well, the, the number one line item on the scouting report for Utah is what are you doing with Rudy Gobert and the high ball screen and him rolling to the rim? There's a lot of different ways you can play that, but you have to get it under control or they will dominate you because if you start sucking in coverage on Gobert at the rim, they got plenty of shooters on the perimeter. So it's a tricky balance, and I'll be fascinated to see what Ty Lue and his staff comes up with. Um, but Mitchell's good. Conley's good. Like, they have a really good roster, and they play well together. Quinn Snyder is, is wildly underrated as an NBA coach to me. And so it's going to be a really good series. I just think when you have the best player, this, this thought has, has been around for years and years. If you have the best player on the floor, you have the best chance to win. And the Clippers have the best player on the floor at Leonard. So I think that gives them the best chance to win. What's your view on Anthony Davis? I'm reading an awful lot about the, the collapse there at the end. Well, I, I just did a radio show before I came on here, and that was the conversation. You have to decide at some point when you put all your eggs into a couple players, which is what you have to do now in the NBA to compete for a championship, mm -hmm. what happens if one of those stars is injury prone? What do you do? Because – He's the main reason they're out of the playoffs is that he wasn't healthy. And so do you keep going with him and just hope and pray that he doesn't continue to get hurt? That's a tough one because you don't trade players like Anthony Davis unless you know that he's going to continue to get hurt. And in my experience and everyone's experience with the league, if you start out your NBA career by getting hurt a lot, you're probably always yeah. going to get hurt a lot. And I don't know if that's the same in football, Glenn, but that thought has been around for a long time that if you're kind of injury prone, you're always going to be injury prone. You know, I think there's that thought a little bit in football, but the difference being what we talked about pre-show in that the grind of that basketball season with 82 games, you can, if you're injured a little bit and try to play, you can really hurt yourself farther down the road. 
Whereas in football, you have a week off between games. You can recover. Um, you can take the time necessary if you're hurt through a season to get ready for the next year. So I don't know that it's 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 quite apples to apples, but I think that grind in the NBA probably makes it more so. That if you're if you're going to be an injured player coming in, you're probably going to stay injured throughout your career. We've always said that basketball guys are way tougher than football guys. That's we've known that for a while, Glenn. So you're not telling Don anything. It it goes exactly against what I just said, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) But Donnie, we just said I just was looking up your stats before because we know about your scoring. You played 127 games at UCLA. 127 games in your career, and you're all-time leading scorer in the conference. The Warriors, those champ five straight years, are playing 100 to 105 games a year, right? With their, all the playoffs in one year. I mean, it's well, mind blowing. To take it one step further with Davis is the word on the street is he doesn't do a lot in the off season to help himself uh, in that regard, like diet, nutri- you know, nutrition, rest, recovery, working on his body. And that may be why he's continued to be injury prone. I wonder if now that it's happened again, does he start getting serious about his off season? Because you can't eliminate all injuries by having great off seasons, but what you can do is eliminate some of the nicks and dings that you get pulled hammies, groins, those kinds of things. You know, you can't guard against coming down on someone's foot and rolling your ankle, but if you spend a lot of time and money on your body in the off season and during the season, it's kind of been proven that you will stay healthier. So I wonder if now it's gotten to that point where he, where he will start doing that. Hopefully for the Lakers, he will. Yeah. Hey, the other one news that really jumped out at me, and it actually has a tie, uh, a little bit of a tie to the pack, is the Boston move, where Brad Stevens leaves the bench to go to the front office. I mean, 10 years ago, this was the hottest coach in college basketball. Oregon kept the job open. Basically, I don't know if it was quite a blank check, but they pretty much were going to give him anything he wanted. And he chose to stay at Butler for one more year. I mean, he's not even 50 years old yet to leave the bench. What was your read on that? Uh, It was a head scratcher just because he's proven to be such a good coach. But you know what, Ted? You don't know what's going on in that locker room. The game's changing. There's so much more player empowerment now in terms of roster construction, guys leaving, guys demanding trades. And so it's really hard to manage locker rooms now. Even in our game, in the college game now. I mean, I I used to – spend this time of year tracking, okay, this guy's leaving, this guy's coming. I don't even look at it anymore until October because it doesn't make any sense. Like, Makes your head hurt. Got a handle on it, and then we get to the preseason. Yeah. You're like, wait a second, where'd these four guys come from? And so it's a little bit like that in the NBA where there's just no, there's no continuity or not as much continuity. That makes it harder to coach, makes it harder to manage personalities, to manage the locker room. And so you wonder if he just got burnt out and that he didn't want to go back to college, maybe for the same reason that he's looking at the transfer portal and going, how the heck am I ever going to get a team to get consistently good like I did at Butler when I got players leaving because they only played 12 minutes a game the season before. And so maybe the solution is to make the same money he's making. I'll just jump up into the front office and make decisions and not worry about it. Here's the one thing that I would – oh, go ahead, Glenn. I was just going to say the one, the one thing I was going to add on Brad Stevens is that I was, I was in Indianapolis working in local news. I covered Butler's two runs to the NCAA championship when he was there. And I remember he came out and had a press conference after he decided not to take the Oregon job. And he said, this is kind of awkward. I've never been asked to have a press conference and had to tell everyone that I'm just keeping my job, but you know, you don't mess with happy. And the thing that I would say about Brad Stevens, and I put him up there almost with no other coach that I've ever met he was so in tune with life outside of what his job was. I mean, I remember when they lost to Duke, I think it was 2010. I asked him like, how'd you, you know, how'd you, what'd you do after that? And he said, I went and played with my kids at the playground at a local indie park. Like he just, Mm -hmm. he is so tuned in on his family. I think he loves and knows the game of basketball so well, but he was done with all the BS in college and what he felt like was a lot, you know, dealing with, and this was before the transfer portal got going um, with recruiting and, you know, some of the cheating that was going on. He was just sort of done with all of that. So it wasn't surprising to me that he didn't necessarily come back to college. I think if there was a job that, that opened up one day that would make sense for him too, I don't think he'd close it off, but I just, I, I, when you bring up Brad Stevens, when I saw that, I was 
surprise. And then also when I really thought about it, I thought, no, I mean, I'm sure there's a family element to it. There's there's got to be some very specific and good reasons why Brad would would go that route. That's probably it, Ash. His family's probably firmly entrenched in Boston. He didn't want to pick him up and move him. And, you know, for a college job that maybe doesn't work out, maybe it does, but that's probably it, that he didn't want to move again. And I'll tell you, and I think I've told you this, Ted, that's why I didn't get into coaching. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to keep moving. You know, I, I, I love where I live. I've lived here since I retired and I don't want to move. And so that's why, that's literally the reason why I never got into coaching is I didn't want to have to move all over the place. Don, the reason I, I, what I was going to ask you about a little bit there is you said how much it's, it's changed and that dynamic and how that can drive a person like, like Stevens out of that locker room. Does it bother you as an older player, the way players seem to play? It, 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 it's more prevalent, I think, in basketball now, but it's becoming prevalent in the NFL as well, that players seem to play for the name on the back of their jersey rather than the guys next to them and that, and that team. Does that yeah. bother you? It bothers me, Glenn, but what I think I've gotten good at over the years is understanding that times change. You know, I hate the guys that go on the air and say, well, when I played, it was okay. Yeah, it was that way when I played, but it's a different time. And so you have to adapt. Do I like it? No, but in the society that we live in of social media, instant gratification, my own brand, everything's about me now as a professional athlete. So it isn't like the olden days. It's a shame. But I also understand what it's about now and and how players have been given the opportunity and allowed to do what I was talking about earlier, to walk into the front office and say, I don't want to play here anymore, trade me. And guess what? They trade them. Whereas when you and I played, Glenn, the GM would have been like, F you, dude, get out of my office. Right? And so yeah, that's our way to do an opportune time to cut you when they didn't have to pay you. <laughs> right. And so it's just different. Now. Is it right or is it well, it's not right or wrong. It's just different. And for guys that played in the era that we played in when it was more about your brothers in the locker room, your teammates, the franchise, the city, it's, it's kind of a long way from there now. Well, Don, you kind of have the best of all worlds. Well, for us, certainly that you're a broadcaster and we get to work with you at at PAC 12 network. The other side is that you still do get to coach and, and kind of do scratch that itch. And again, maybe something that (laughs) Not everybody knows, but you you work out with a lot of NBA draft prospects, help them get ready for their draft. So can you kind of walk us through that part of your world? And I'm just like curious how you find time to drink wine with the like five jobs that you have. Before I go to bed, whenever that is. <laughs> um, so I've been doing this for 17 years now, and I used to do it for another agency. Now I work for CAA and basically whoever they sign to be to represent their, their agent, they come out here. I work with a guy by the name of Ryan Capretti. You may know that name, Glenn. He was in the NFL for a while. He, he, he owns a sports performance uh, company and building that we train at. So we partner together. And so whoever CA gets his players, they come to us and we get them ready for Chicago Combine. We get them ready for individual team workouts. All players will go see teams. You know, the higher draft picks will only go to see three or four teams in their draft range. But then we have guys that will see 12 to 15 teams um, because they're slotted a little bit lower down. And so this year we have six players. It could be we've had four. We've had 13. We had 13 three years ago. So it changes every year. But we're basically getting them ready to be a pro basketball player by starting to talk about nutrition, uh, you know, the sports performance side of it, mobility, agility, weightlifting, all that stuff that maybe they've done a little bit of. But then the on-court stuff that I do is about understanding, you know, more NBA stuff, terminology, how much more physical it is, stuff that you're going to need so that when they go to these team workouts, they can help themselves and hopefully move up in the draft um, or just keep where they're at. But it's it's my – and I love everything that I do. It's my favorite thing that I do. I, I couldn't do it for 12 months. It's pretty intense. We get after these guys every day. It's six days a week. This year, because of the calendar and then moving the NBA draft back to late July, it's usually late June, we had an extra three and a half weeks. So we've been going since April 19th. And here we are on June 7th. We still got another month, which is fine, um, but it gets long. And these guys all move out here for the whole time. But we've had a tremendous amount of success with the program that we've designed and that we implement for guys 
to move up in the draft, which we've had a lot of success with that. But the summer league starts nine days after the draft, and they got to be ready for that. And so it's it's about getting drafted higher, but it's also about getting ready for summer league. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we're we're right in the middle of it right now. But we actually this year have the best group. It's going to turn out to be the best group we've ever had. All six guys are going to be first round picks. Oh, and we usually don't have that. Usually we get two, three first rounders, maybe a lottery or two. But then we have a couple second rounders. But this year, the group that we have is, is I would be shocked if they're not all picked in the first round. I'm thirsty. Yeah. I'm hey, yeah, I'm yeah. What am I doing? <laughs> All right, Ash, lead us around the horn here. What, what's well, everybody I, well, I was going to say, Ted, have? I, I want to dive into our wine in the second that that Glenn and Don and I are drinking. But because you are, the reason that this is the Bordeaux Bonanza episode, as I mentioned in, in the open, is that mm. you're in Paris. <laughs> so I know that you had um, plenty of wonderful French wines and Bordeaux to pick from. What what are you drinking? Well, uh, and I, uh, those who know a little bit know, I've been here, I think 20, this is the 27th or 28th time to Paris. So I've had plenty of opportunity to go. And as you learn in Paris, you can go to the little markets, the supermarché supermarkets, and you can buy 10 to 15 euro bottles of Bordeaux that are outstanding. That's what, it's a staple of life here. It's what they drink as the dinner wine every night. And then of course you can get the experience of having the super megas. So tonight in honor of Captain Cab coming, my restaurant that I had dinner at eight consecutive nights. This is Margot 2014, my Chateau Margot. Uh, and so I had a little bit of it at dinner and have a little bit left here at 1.20 in the morning. But for those who don't know, Margot is the third growth of the Chateau Margot uh, vineyard, Chateau Margot being obviously one, Pavillon Rouge two. And I just looked it up. Uh, they told me 2014 was a great year. They weren't kidding. because. Uh, Margot themselves say they only used sixty percent of the growth that year of their harvest. Rather, went to Chateau Margot and Pavillon Rouge. So for the third run here at Margot, they had forty percent of their harvest, which is really, really good. Um, and it's forty nine. How about this, Don? Forty nine percent cab, forty nine percent Merlot, which is another thing you find out about the board. That would at least give me to try it. I don't know. I don't know if I drink the whole bottle, but I was going to say <laughs> you're more of a man than me to have any wine left in the bottle at 1:20 a.m. Uh, well, it's, again, that's when we knew we were having you on, but I mean, this is really, uh, and 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 I and I'll, I'll I won't go too deep on this, but I'll tell you because I went to Chateau Margot, and I think I've told Glenn this. This was five years or five years ago, give or take a year, and we went down to after my trip here for tennis. We went down to Chateau Margot. And it's extraordinary because you can't just drive in. There's not, this is not Nap in Sonoma County. You don't just get driving up to the tasting room. They don't have tasting rooms. You get an invitation, you go, and they give you a, a very gracious tour. Uh, and I found out they have Chateau Margot hires on staff full time a Cooper. They have their own Cooper, which is astonishing. He his job is to make barrels. And I have a video on my phone of about three minutes long of watching him shaving some wood and trying to bend some metal, but he makes 50 barrels a year. That's his job really? for Chateau Margot. And I, I, I was just utterly blown away, but it's the devotion that they put into to their wine is that they pay whatever the salary is. And he basically does a barrel a week. Does that make sense, Glenn? It does. Yeah. You know, the first call with a classified growth like that. There, it's more than just the wine. They also have their own standards that they always are that they're always putting forward. And anything not of that standard, you know, they, they have not been classified. There's only been one that was added since 1855. So they don't reclassify. So you can the worst thing you do, it's akin to losing a Michelin star. If you're if you're one of the first growths and you could somehow and somehow you did wrong with by your barrels, by your, by your processes, enough times became consistent that you lost your standing. That's the shame they would face. So it makes complete sense that uh, they would keep face by hiring their own Cooper right on right on grounds to craft barrels for them to move on because remember they growth went into the third growth and that's not the barrels they're using right and i, I was so to, to maybe wrap a little bit on the bordeaux thing 
uh, uh, we're going to try to get him on on one of these episodes coming up. Uh, a good friend of mine is Rob Davis, who just stepped down after 45 years, I believe. He was the winemaker for Jordan and uh, Jordan Cab. Uh, and Rob was trained by a f- famous French uh, Andre, and I'm blanking on his last name. Famous French, you probably know the name Glenn, but uh, anyway, he was trained by him. So two weekends ago, I was seeing him up in uh, in Healdsburg. And I, he turned me on to something I didn't realize. You know, in the 60s, Bordeaux, Don, produced 60% white wine. Really? Only 40% red wine in the 1960s. That was the way wine was doing it. And they only bottled, apparently, the very best of each vintage. They drank. They drank it, but didn't bottle a lot. And 1970 was basically a, 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 a turning point. And then the oil crisis that those of us of age can remember, the oil crisis in the uh, mid, early 70s, really, st- really accelerated it. So by, by 1975 now, the Bordeaux vineyards are all bottling their own stuff. That was when it changed. And now today, so now to finish this, today in Bordeaux, it's 87% red. <laughs> That's Don's heaven. Can I, can I tell you a quick Jordan Cab story? Yeah. To, to, to just keep uh, illuminating my weirdness. So my favorite meal in the country is at Prime Steakhouse in the Bellagio in Vegas. Okay. Mm-hmm. I order the exact same thing every time I go. And every time it's a bottle of Jordan Cab with that meal. Nice. Every time. I'm going to have to have you connect with Rob. because We're going to get Rob to do one of these episodes with yeah. us because he's a great, great storyteller about, about the wine business. But... That I mean, I, I don't know how you all think about that, but when I heard that that, that in the sixties, I mean, I, none of us think of Bordeaux with white wine. Sixty percent white. Glenn, did you have any idea? Well, I I like Sauternes, and I do like uh, I, and I like the Sauvignon Blanc and some of the Sauvignon Gris. Uh, they they do nice blends, but no, I mean they they've become so well known because the Bordeaux blend of red that mm-hmm. it would be very hard to contemplate that much white was being produced compared to red. All right. So Ted, I got to say, I mean, we're not, we're not quite drinking what you're drinking tonight and you're in Paris and that's probably why Uh, next year, by the way, I think we're all coming to the French open and we're going to do outside the vines in your hotel room in France. I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, Can we talk about what we're drinking tonight? Cause I'm really curious to hear what what both. I'm really curious to hear what both Don and Glenn think about this one. So as I mentioned before, this is a creative impulse. It's a Bordeaux. Let's see. Can you see it? Bordeaux uh, blend from the state of Washington, 2015 Rasa creative impulse is the name. It's been around for nine years guys, and it's never received anything lower than a 92 point rating. This particular one had a 94 point rating. So Don, I'm going to start with you since you're our special guest and, and less critical than Glenn Parker sometimes. <laughs> what uh, what do you make of the wine? Because I I think it's I fantastic. Like the <laughs> I, I like the I like the 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 hard driving alcoholic flat wines, the big ones. And if you can tell me that a non cab can can get there like a blend, then I like it. And that this 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 tastes like something that I would drink normally. And I wouldn't order that because I don't really order Bordeaux blends. But if if I didn't know what was on the bottle, I would think that it would be something that I would normally order. See, by the way, this is why I love Don. Like that that's the type of wine descriptions that I could get behind. Hard driving alcohol. Like that's <laughs> you, I speak your language, Don. And the and Don, though, you know, there, that's so this is where you just said this is not normally something in order because you probably have, it sounds, I know exactly the type of wines you're talking about, but in California, one of the things that has really become come to prominence is the Bordeaux blends that have more of that because they are, they're more popular in the, the high-end bars and restaurants. So they are producing a lot more of those. They're, they're still Bordeaux blends because they just, all those grapes give a little different characteristic. They're not all the same grape. And I love this. This is a good wine for me. But to me, I I would like to see a little more Cabernet Franc to give it a better nose. Uh, Just a little bit, a little bit in there, maybe a little Petit Verdot for the same reason, but that's only because of my taste. Um, But then I'm also a guy, have you ever, since you're a cab guy, I would would love for you to open a bottle of Cahors. Those are Malbecs from the extreme region 
on the river through through uh, Bordeaux, uh, the Dordogne. And it, they're, they're, they, in the medieval times, everyone knows the black wines of Cahors. They were, they're dark, super inky. Uh, same with the other one in that same region is Mariran. And if you can get those, most of your wine stores will have them. They'll blow you away. They'll be darker and inkier and heavier than, than any cab you've ever had. So I, I please give them a shot. There's so many good wines for you to try that'll meet that profile you're talking about that just aren't caps. Text me or email me that. Will you, I'll give you my number or something. Tell, yeah, when we're all said and done, we'll communicate. Yeah. And I'm we here. should point out, I, I have not mentioned that the one that we're drinking that, that Glenn and, and Don and I are drinking is 72% cab, 28% Merlot. So Glenn, I want to just di dive, dive us a little deeper into when, when you uh, took your first sip and your reaction to it, like what, what is it that you notice about this particular Bordeaux blend? There's, there's a dark fruit right on it. There's there, the dark fruit hits you. Um, and then there's, it's, it's not quite lead pencil like you would see in a traditional Bordeaux, but it's kind of edging on it. And then you kind of slide into your, a uh, little more of your tobaccos and your leather. So it, it, I think dark fruit is right up front. That's what you, it hits you. And certainly if you take a, a sip that you can breathe out on upon swallowing, you can really, it comes through. It's a very round wine. It's not particularly a tannic monster, but it's got some good tannins for backbone. So I think it's going to last a while. But it's not one of those things you go, holy cow, I can't drink this for 10 years or 15 years. We're sitting at six years right now. It's very drinkable at this point. Lead pencil. That's not a uh, that's not a phrase I've thought of, Glenn, about Bordeaux. I think if you if you give yourself a chance, you know, like pencil shavings, that lead pencil, <laughs> you will find that often. It's it, Next time you're having a, a Bordeaux or whatnot or um, give yourself just give it that light whiff and you'll you'll pick yeah. that up. Okay. Yeah. All right. I definitely takes. I, I'm with you, Glenn. The dark fruit really jumps out at you right off the bat. And you know, again, the 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 back end of it is good too. I, you know, sometimes when you get that heavy fruit, it's like, mm, you know, the, the back end's not great. But this one's good. I like this. Yeah, it finishes nicely. It's got a little bit. It's got some tannin in there. You yeah. know, I think you've got another five to seven years to enjoy this before it probably starts going south on you. All right, so Don, what's the heaviest big swing in cab in your world? Well, I think we have a list we're going to go through at some point. Um, Can we do that now? I think we should do that now. I will tell you this, though, and not to make anyone jealous, but my 50th birthday party, my wife wanted to have a party for me, like a party party. And I'm, you guys know me, I'm Mr. Party. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, and so she ended up at my friend's restaurant who I was telling you about earlier, we had just a dinner for about 75 people and the menu was Wagyu New York's and Camus all night. Mm. The only wine served was Camus. So that bill was pretty expensive, but worth it. Everybody appreciated the Camus all night. Yeah. I've heard the stories. Yeah. Um, all right. So we we have renowned those of us, those of you who have watched Don with us on Pac-12 Games know that we love the, the the collaboration of Don with Adam Gordon can get really creative <laughs> and they love these little concoctions. So we have, I understand, Mac on the rack. Which is a derivative of Mac on the pack. Right. Right. It's typically Mac on the pack, for those of you that watch the Pac-12 network, it's usually four things I'm thinking about for storylines for whatever. And so we're just going to make that Mac on the rack and rank some wines or at least not rank them, but maybe uh, list them of wines that I have had in my cellar. I think I still have a couple in my cellar um, and talk about them. So these are, these are your five, right? Are these your best five? And I, and I'll be honest and I did it um, off the top of my head. I didn't go down there and I didn't, I didn't put a ton of thought into it just because I wanted it to be like, what comes to my head first of, of five wines that I like? Cause there's obviously way we could do a list of a hundred wines. Right. Um, but these are the five that kind of popped into my head right off the bat. If you're asking me my five favorites that I've had. Okay. Um, and All right. you, want to start ask, you want me to yeah, let's start? tell, let's tell people, go ahead. So the fifth one, I came up with Joseph Phelps insignia. That was one of the first wines I've had. Um, 
that I, when I started, what I, what we were talking about earlier with my friend that owns a restaurant, that was one of the first big red wines that I tried and I loved it. And I still get it from time to time, but I've, the one thing I have gotten better at is trying different stuff. Even though I'm still really only drinking cabs, I'm not just locked into certain brands and certain wineries. I do try and try different stuff now, but Insignia was was one of my favorites early on and still is. I just don't get it as much as I used to. Uh, the fourth one, that, which is one that you like, Ted, was Quintessa. Yeah. That Again, early on, it was one of the first ones I had and I loved it. Um, you know, I haven't had it. I actually haven't had it. That's That tells you how much I liked it is I haven't had a bottle of Quintessa in a while and it made the list. <laughs> um, so fond That's memories a- of that one. Yeah, it's a great call. That one, I, I think that doesn't get as much notoriety and attention as the other big swinging cabs that we may talk about, but I, I think that's fabulous. Yeah, very good. Glenn, you can chime in with whatever you want on, on these wines too. You know more I, I, about it than I do. Insignia is one of my all-time favorites. I think that they have they've consistently turned out a great wine. I think the first one I had was in 86, and I've had... I've owned verticals of them all the way up until 2002 or three before I started. Don, you might not know this. I had a very, very large seller for a long time and I ended up selling, I'll just say, if I used to say several thousand bottles really? uh, out of my cellar to downsize. So I'm now at about 600, but I, and it was several, it wasn't a couple, it wasn't a few, it was several thousand bottles I had to sell. So I, I had a lot of verticals and I just, you get to a point where you can drink a bottle every day for like the rest of your life. And you're like, okay, that's, I think I have enough wine now. So it's time to try some new things. Kept, kept the odds and ends and, and sold them off. So insignia. It only was- took Adam Gordon two years to get over it. Glenn. <laughs> and yes, the parties at our house after uh, before football games were quite epic uh, with the wine consumption. But um, Contessa, I love, I, I think I have one bottle left of Contessa and it's a 94 sitting out in my, uh, I think it is. I think it's a 94 sitting out there. Uh, so far. I love, I like your list. I agree with them. You know, it's, again subjective what what you like what comes to mind so keep rolling i can't wait to hear the rest i just remembered and i mentioned it earlier about my friend and how you know the the wineries would blow out the vintages and they just want to get rid of it insignia was one of them i believe the year was 2004 this is going to blow your mind they had to get rid of it and so my friend bought 106 packs of insignia wow you know how much per bottle glenn well, I'm dying to hear, but I'll get jealous. 2004, $25 a bottle. And I bought, and I thought I was doing good. I'm like, you know, give me five, six packs. In hindsight, I should have bought 56 packs. And 25 bucks a bottle? Are you kidding me? Yeah. So, you could have got your hands on. Yeah, seriously, I should have. Um, all right, next up, uh, Silver Oak, Napa Valley, one of my all time favorites. Um, the difference, which is interesting, between Alexander Valley and Napa Valley, to me, is pretty apparent. Between the two wines, I know one's way the Napa is way more expensive than the Alexander Valley. But again, going back to when I first started drinking big, heavy cabs, Silver Oak kind of popped into my mind as one of the is one of the all time greats that I've had. Yeah, it's it's one of those. It's a standby. It is one of those. Uh, anywhere you go in Napa, any list you're going to find, Silver Oak's going to be on it. It's it was kind of the original. I, I don't quote me on this thing. You know, I'm, I'm probably wrong, but it was one of the early on cults that when it was released, people had to be there. People had to get it. So yeah, no, that one makes sense completely. If you and I, I haven't seen one in a long time, but if you're rolling around town and you see somebody, somebody's car with a license plate frame that says Silver Oak. That means your wine's probably doing pretty good because there was a car that around this neighborhood that had a license plate frame, that said <laughs> Silver Oak, something or other. Um, Dustin Meyer was living near you, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and this was a tough. The, t- the top two were tough because came a special selection is probably if I if I had to go, you gave me a free pick of a bottle. It's probably the way I'd go. But, you know, we'll get to the number one in a second, but came a special selection is just one of the all timers for me. Like, mm-hmm. I just, I don't know why I just, I love it more than most other wines I've ever had. It's, you make a great pick where it's grown, the Wagner family, what they've been able to accomplish by being great farmers and stewards of the land, um, not trying to do too much with what they do, letting that, that fruit speak for itself every year came a special select is it's 
it is a, a absolutely outstanding wine almost every single vintage yeah it's i've never vintage. had a bad glass of that and i and i can't wait to hear last one i've got it tight i'm excited oh, yeah, it's gonna love it so so with my friend again i hate to keep bringing him up but he's kind of my you know my my guide through the world of wine years ago I'm going to say 15 years ago, because he sells so much wine at his restaurants, we were able through Southern Wine to go stay on the Mandavi property before he sold it. So there's like seven cottages on the property. Maybe there's more now, maybe less, but we got to stay in one of them. And this was early on. Well, I, I'd been drinking wine for a few years by then. And Glenn, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I remember, that the Tokalon Vineyard at Mandavi is like a football size vineyard right next to the main property correct yeah it's it's kind of in the back and just just off to the side of the main property yes and so when i first tasted the mandavi reserve tokalon it blew and i'd already had a bunch of really good wines it just connected with me uh, of all the wines i liked at that point and oh i love this i love that i'm like this is the best wine i've ever had and again glenn correct me if i'm wrong they made it for years then they stopped making it the Tokalon Reserve. And now they started making it again, like three, four or five years ago or something like that. Does that sound right? That sounds right. I'm not sure the exact years they did that. So uh, Tokalon, it, it, it means like the, the highest good. Um, that's what that meant. And it wasn't, it, it was a vineyard that Robert Mondavi wanted. He really wanted to get into that vineyard because he always loved that, that fruit. And so when they started doing that, um, you're right, they started doing vineyard selection. So the they originally started with like Oakville, Rutherford, and I forget the other one. They had three designates that were all incredible. Um, all the fruit came from the, that area and nothing else. And then when they put out Tokalon, it was a game changer when it came to designated cabs. Um, the Robert Rodavi Reserve Tokalon Vineyard is, and I'm so happy you put that at the last. I will upset you. I sold two cases. I still got 11 bottles out there. I drank one and I said, I can't sell this. I have to keep these. <laughs> and they're 97s. And they, I just had the 97. I probably kept, I probably kept 12 or 13 bottles in fact too, because I just had a 97 just like two years ago and it was fresh and young and wasn't going anywhere. And it was a 97. So great pick. Love that pick as a matter of fact, because as you know, I, uh, I interned up there in my off seasons to football. Uh, when I was with the Bills, I stayed on property. I led tours and tastings love the people up there they were great to me and that wine is one that just yeah. resonates with me i'll tell you how much uh, i think of that wine when unfortunately when our friend mike yam uh left the pac-12 network that's the bottle of wine i sent him that's how much i think of that wine fantastic that is well, Ashley, I wasn't kidding. We are the we're the lightweights here, man. Well, yeah. I was just going to say, I think if, if nothing else, the last about 10 minutes has confirmed that Adam Gordon made a huge mistake and should have had Glenn <laughs> and Don and maybe Ted as a guest host and me just like, I, I could have helped you on the technical side, maybe Adam, but I don't even know why I'm a part of this thing, but that, you that was sell awesome. yourself short, Ashley. No, I mean, I'm here, I'm here to drink wine and, and listen. Amen. And, but that's that's what it's all about. Ashley, you've been picking up your glass very consistently throughout this <laughs> it's show. It's the one you know? thing that I bring to the podcast, Don. You know, you know me well. Um, Ashley, how are you on the big Ashley, how are you on the big hitting cabs? I, they, well, I will say I was looking at Don's list because I actually got a sneak peek at it but before he unveiled it. And and I have tried everyone and love every single one, except I don't think I have had the Mandavi Reserve. So I haven't either, yeah. Uh, that's now officially my list, but Camus has been my favorite. That, I, yeah. Camus I was waiting, Don and Glenn, where, where does Harlan come down in, in your guys' world? I've tasted Harlan. I owned many, as you know, I've owned a lot of cases of it and just basically as an investment and sold it. Mm -hmm. um, but I have tasted, I like it quite a bit. I don't know that to me it's worth the price that you're going to get into one of the, and this is where I go against a lot of the, the wine um, snobs is that I think most cult wines are completely overpriced for yes. what you're going to get. I think some of your bigger, older Napa houses, the Robert Madavis, the insignias, the Schaefer's um, screaming, the Chateau Montalena's, you know, they, those bigger, older houses oh, yeah, yeah. produce great wines 
in quantity at a price point that makes them a very nice special occasion wine. Cult wines make a great wine that, oh my God, I'm going to mortgage my home to get. And I don't think they're worth it. I just, I'll go against the aficionados I, uh, and, and the, the gurus. And I just think you're better off going with a well-known house in a good vintage and you can't be wrong. Totally agree. That's why I said Screaming Eagle. That's the cult wine. Like, I, yes. if you've ever had Screaming Eagle, it's like, okay, yeah, this is pretty good, but it ain't worth five thousand a bottle or whatever they're getting for. It's not even close. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's worth what people pay, and people pay it, but it's not worth it for me. That's, I'm going to ask you guys like kind of a naive question: like, how does, how is it possible that there is wine that is produced that you could spend thousands of dollars on a single bottle? Like, I, I, I truly don't understand it. It's all ego, right, Glenn? I mean, I was going to say it's ego. People have an ego about the wines they hold and what they have. And, right. um, you know, if people you say, well, let's break out of all that. I'm like, no, I'm selling this. I'm not, <laughs> I wasn't even, I wasn't even proud. I had it in my cellar. I kind of hit it. I just didn't want anybody to know. I was like, I gotta get rid of this. <laughs> Screaming Eagle, there, there was, I'm going to say it was three years ago now in the Costco near where I live on the peninsula in the Bay Area had a one bottle. The Costco had a bottle of Screaming Eagle. I think it was 2,600. And I've had the chance to have some because I just have had been in the right place at the right time. And you start doing the math and it's about 60 bucks a swig, every, like every taste you take. And you start going, exactly the point. I mean, it's nice wine, but come on. Glenn, you sound like you, I think you, you, you and I are probably alike in the sense that I'm always trying to find the $40 bottle that's really, really good versus spending $200 <laughs> a bottle that's like not as good. Like one that I've been drinking a lot lately um, that I got from my friend is Pine Ridge. He gets oh. 32 a bottle and that's it's good. great, like really, really good wine for that, for that price. So I used to, when I first got, when I first moved in Tucson after I retired, I was doing the broadcast world. People knew that I was into wines and I'd get invited at tastings occasionally or the, you know, the, the, you know, the club where the guys have, uh, they got to bring out their biggest bottle. Like every, like once a month they get together and they're all trying to outdo each other with this great bottle of wine. And they were always blind tasting. And I always told them, I said, you're never going to like me in your group because I'm going to bring a bottle. I'm going to spend way less than you. And if you're going to love this bottle of wine. I said, but we can do it. And I, I brought a bottle of eleven dollar bottle of Murrieta Old Vine Red non vintage, and it blew them all away. <laughs> it's understanding the pro flavor profile that that people want and where they're at, and is it always that good? No, but you're right. That that to me, the thrill of the chase is what great bottle can I get at the cheapest price? What second label can I get? Like either, one of the the things that people have to understand in the great vintages, the best vintages, go for the second label. If you don't want to spend a ton, go for the second label. You're going to get great wine because they're they're out of the same year, the same vineyard, the same barrels. The only difference is they didn't fl fit the flavor profile the yeah. winemaker wanted when they were blending. And he's holding up his third growth there from a great year. That's a great bottle of wine. It's 100, 100 euros and Pavillon Rouge. If you can occasionally see Pavillon Rouge in some good wine stores in the U.S., 150 probably. Yeah, 100, yeah, 150, 175 a bottle for the second growth Chateau Margaux. That's out, there. and that's an occasion wine. Obviously, it's not every night, and but it's an occasion is, wine. That's <laughs> that's a great bottle. Yeah. And what is Chateau Margaux again? And there, that's your how oh, much no, I, you're yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So I will I will tell <laughs> the, the the trip to Margaux very quickly. So a young young woman who spoke enough English to communicate with us, gave us the tour. So now at the end of the 45 minute tour, we get a little tasting and she brings out, um, and I forget the years, but she brings out a Margot and a Pavillon Rouge, the second row. Now it's 10 30 in the morning. So she pours the Margot into her glass and does the very, you know, very proper swirl and, and then takes a, a good, you know, probably two ounce taste of the Margot and, turns around and right in the spittoon. And I'm sitting there going, that's $150 right there. That's 150 bucks of wine you just spit out. It's like, uh, anyway. You know what I was just thinking about, Glenn, since you know so much about Mandavi, when we went on that trip where I told you we stayed on the property and all that, my wife stumbled in and not a lot of people carry it. It's not, it's not around a lot, but she literally has been drinking it ever since. And she's been drinking that Fumé Blanc that they make for 20 years. 
It's it's it is a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal white wine. It doesn't go through uh, metallic fermentation, so it's got a crispness to it. it. It's you know it's one of the it's a Sauvignon Blanc that just is done very very well. It was our house white for years in my houses in Buffalo and Kansas City. I love it. You're absolutely right. It's great. Right. And they make some great vineyard designates of that, or they used to um, designates or, or reserve that were over the top good. If you had with oysters or seafood, they were incredible. So yeah, she's got good taste. I don't know what she saw in you. I was just going to say, I mean, she's got one blind spot. <laughs> but not. She's got excellent taste. You know what she I saw, but ask, I could like, pay for the Fumé Blanc or. Great point. Okay. Helps every marriage. Uh, Glenn, I got to ask you, and then I want to ask Ted about some tennis before he has to go catch a flight, I think, here in a few minutes. But how do you, knowing everything you know about wine, having the cellar that you have, like, how do you choose what you're going to drink on any given night? Is so I have house, house wines. I, mean, I don't drink nearly as much wine as I used to. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying to stay somewhat slim as I get older. Um, but it's, it's, I have house wines, and that's your normal pick. But if we're going to be, and I have a house white, house red kind of things, I don't mind just pulling out. And then I've got wines that if we're going to have um, a steak or a great piece of fish, or, or I'm going to match that food to the, I'm going to match the wine to the food and pull the bottle out of that that I want, that I want the most that evening. So I, I generally pick it that way, house wine. And then if it's a special meal or a once a week meal, I'll pick if we're doing a great steak or if we're doing a wonderful slice of fish or something, then I'll. I'll switch it up and, and I'll pull something out that has a great play, flavor profile for what we're having. And I'm a big fan of Pinot Noirs, as, as Ted knows. And 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 Don, one thing I never did is I, I refused to get into Burgundies because when you talk cult wines, yep. it, there is nothing in the California cult wine world, the Bordeaux world, that even touches the price of Burgundy world. It is it, a, a great Burgundy, like a great Pinot Noir, is I, I, I can only liken it to one thing, and you know, I've never been there, like your first hit of crack. And you're gonna be going after that same high for the next 20 years of your life, and all you're gonna do is spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to get it, and you're never gonna get it again. It just, <laughs> you've, got, you've got to hold yourself back. I refuse to try Burgundy for that reason. All, all the rich idiots I know drink Burgundies. Seriously, <laughs> all the rich idiots I know drink Burgundies. But it's interesting, Glenn. I, you know, I don't have as many bottles in my cellar as I used to. I have like a 500 bottle cellar. It's probably not even probably a third full right now, but I did it the same way. I'd have my, my, I didn't do it by food cause I don't know enough about it, but I had like the house wines like you. Then I had kind of a mid tier. Those were for people that were coming over that knew anything remotely about wine. And then I had my, my stuff like on the list that I shared with you guys, but it was always funny when I'd go down there, when people are coming over, I'd stand in front of the cellar and go, well, all right, these people coming over don't know anything about wine. They're getting the house wine. And then another time, if it's somebody that knew anything, okay, you know, they know a little bit. I'll pull out that for them. But it was always, it wasn't about food. It was more about who was going to be here drinking the wine. I'm not going to waste good wine on people that drink Coors Lights for the so, most part. So here's the here's the challenge. Like Coors Light. Well, no, but here's the challenge in our little group, Don. So when our esteemed producer, Michael Molinari, comes to your house, that's when you have to make sure – you have the house wine ready. <laughs> Several bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? What you do with that? <laughs> poor, poor his head. Well, you, you, you drink a chemist the night before, keep the bottle, open up your crappy <laughs> stuff and fill up the chemist <laughs> there you bottle. Go. With the, with there the, you go. And then you give it to them because you know you're going to go through four bottles. Hey, Don, real night. quickly, what, what, what do you make of the NBA we, we, uh, in terms of it? We read. Uh, at least you're m- much closer to it. But, you know, guys who obviously have disposable income are getting more into wine in the league now. Isn't J.J. Redick a big wine dude now? Yeah, I don't I, – I think it just kind of caught on. And, you know, a lot of guys, it's – it's for me, and that was one of the reasons why I started drinking it and keep drinking is it puts you to sleep. It's worked for me for years, and I think that's part of it for some guys. Um, but I think it's more like Glenn's been talking about. It's kind of – cachet and debonair to like drink really good red wine versus getting shots of tequila, you know? And so I think the guys have kind of, I don't know, grabbed yeah. onto that, that, you know, I drink this bottle and that bottle and put it on. Instagram. All right. So it's a status thing as opposed to a, okay. I think so. I think, I think 
a big part of it is that. But I think like like with me, Ted, I think a lot of guys try it and they really like it. And they like the red wine and they like, you know, the effects of the red wine um, and helping them wind down or whatever it is. The effects of the red wine, not like the burgundy, which would be confused with your first taste of crack, which. We <laughs> well, also, Don, I know for, for me what it was is and if I was out to dinner the night before a game, a glass of red wine was perfect. Mm-hmm. The night I'm not, I'm not getting drunk. I have no effects from it, but it was relaxing and I could enjoy it with my meal. You also know guys, as you know, after a game or before a game, they go out and they'll have, you know, a lot of beers or a lot of whiskey. It's like, Ooh, no, not for me. I, I, I always liked it because it was a moderating influence on a, an industry, which there's not a lot of moderating influences on. Now there are, but back as you know, um, it was a little wilder and, crazy back in the day yeah well and i like i said i didn't start drinking wine until the very end of my playing career and then it became more but yeah it's i just think it's more yeah it's not it's not as much of a party in pro sports as it used to be when you and i played it's more of a let's go to dinner like you're saying let's go to dinner have a great meal have wine not let's go to the strip club and, you know, drink beers and whiskey all night. Right. Yeah. I was just going to ask, is that like, a new, is that like next week's podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I'm, another podcast that I'd like to be a host on. Just, I was just I was just Googling to see Robert Parker. Did he ever mention crack in a review of a burgundy? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, just our, I, our Parker I does not review the burgundy. It was the effects of having that first grade burgundy. <laughs> just as, some people might say it's like that first cigarette. Tent. <laughs> always a uh, yes. high. But I'll just <laughs> go right to crack. <laughs> uh, okay, guys. I don't. I really don't want this to end, and I would keep going for the next few hours. But I, I want to be respectful of Ted. Who? What? You have to catch a flight here in a little few hours. Yeah, don't worry about me. This hmm. is, come on, we yeah, have Donnie Mack you. here and Glenn Parker, with two of the great commentators of the Pac-12 network. That's true. Well, then it's officially your job to wrap this thing up. Ted, you can say when it's over, but. By the way, I told Ashley, Ted, I didn't know where you were, so I didn't reach out, but I don't know if I'm supposed to announce it or not, but I recently agreed to a new two-year contract with Pac-12 network. I haven't signed it yet, but Whoa. it's agreed to. Breaking news on Outside the Vines. Yeah, so you're stuck with me for another couple of years, Ted, whether you want to be or not. Good for you. Hey. Congratulations. Thank you for your life, Don. <laughs> thank you for your life. <laughs> and thank you for ours, Don. Thank yeah. you for our lives. Uh, okay, so, but Ted, before we, but before I hand it over to you to, I mean, either continue this or tell us to go to bed, um, how has it, how has Paris Ben, how has the French Open been? There's obviously been a ton of headlines, and by the time this thing posts, probably more will have happened. But g- give us a good story or two. Well, I, yeah, and I'll try to keep this quick. So the cultural thing has been st- stunning because I was here in October, and in October we were the bad guys as Americans, and France didn't want us around. We were not doing well with COVID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and we had to jump through amazing hoops to come here, and France was open at the time. Now, seven months later, we come back here and France is in a mess. This place, they've been, they're just emerging from a lockdown now. Um, Restaurants have just been open for 10 days, outdoor seating only, and it's nine o'clock curfew, 9 p.m. At 9 p.m., right, this time of year in Paris, it is light. It does not get dark till just after 10. So it's been hard. Um, Now, the flip side is I had to get a test yesterday morning to be able to fly back to the U S and then when I land in the U S tomorrow, I have to get tested again before I can work at the Olympic trials. That's the U S now saying, we don't want you bringing any of that stuff back from France. And the frustration is we're all vaccinated now, but yeah. the vaccinations are not, not seeming to have a big impact on that front. So what, what the end of the story for Paris is uh, having been here now twice in, in eight months, I can tell you, they need the tourism money. They had zero tourism money in 2020 and they need it. And it's obviously it comes largely from two places, Americans and Asians. And that's largely the people that have the money and were willing to come here. So they need to get it back. Uh, tennis was was fascinating because Roger Federer pulled out of a major championship after winning uh, three matches. The third one was a grueling match the other night. But you just I'll tell you what, if any other player had done that, there would have been a huge uproar 
that's how that's how revered Federer is that he could do that and not create a huge tsunami. Um, Serena got beat again, and I thought this was a great chance for her to win. Coco Goff, I called her match this morning. She is real. This young woman is real. She's 17 and remarkably poised. And I don't know if she's going to win this thing. That may be too soon, but she's going to be a player for a long time. And then the last part, which maybe gets to our, our guests here, you know, the, the first three days of this thing were completely hijacked by the Naomi Osaka story, which I know and I've heard enough from enough people back home. It really blew up in the U.S. Uh, I, I know a little bit about it from the standpoint that I think this is a problem. It's a Naomi Osaka problem. I think she's fighting. And I've watched some and called some matches of hers in the last few years where I thought she's fighting some issues that a lot of people fight. There's nothing wrong with it. But I believe that what she tried to do was kind of, or what she did, whether she was trying to or not, was she pulled everybody else in with her. And if you know, every tennis player that was asked supported Naomi Osaka. Not one single player supported her stance. Not one. Not one player came out and said, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to do press either. And that I thought was very telling. Um, I think most everybody understands it's an obligation and you handle it. And even if you don't like it, you master the art of saying nothing, which Glenn and Don did, I'm sure. And most every of my elected, broadcasting every, career, Ted. Every, <laughs> ele- every elected official we have in America learns how to do that. You learn how to not say things. Every football, I mean, God, football coaches have PhDs in that, right? So unfortunately, Osaka, I just I, I feel for her because she's uh, she's great. She's great for the sport. And uh, but she's dealing with some things that I hope that I hope now she's I think she's going to be away for a little while uh, that she can deal with them. And the major thing now for her, the Olympics, she's chosen to represent Japan. It's she's lived in the United States since she was three years old, but her mother was born in or she was born actually in Japan because of her mother. Um, She has to go. (laughs) I mean, the sponsorship money is massive with her. So she has to go to the Olympics. Uh, and that, to me, will be the next seven weeks away, six weeks away, probably. That's going to be the next kind of crisis point for her. Are the Olympics definitely happening, Ted? Uh, well, I, I uh, have. I was on a call the other night about it. I have another one tomorrow that I'll miss because I'm flying, and then another one Wednesday. All these major seminar calls, so the plans are going on. I mean, it's. Um, I'm be honest with you. After 11 Olympics on site, I'm going to Connecticut for this one, and I'm okay with it. It's not going to feel like an Olympics, but it's not going to feel like an Olympics there either because everybody's going to be in a bubble, and you're not going to be free to do anything. Athletes need to be. I mean, it's that's just that's a shame, but that's another. That's that's way outside the minds. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that, Ted. Yeah. Um, I do want to ask you this: you know, we I've been paying attention to the Olympic storyline, the, the timeline. And it seems as if um, there was a prob- it was, probability it was coming higher and higher that it was going to happen. And in the last couple of weeks, it almost seems like it's reverse course. Probabilities, it, it's trending away from happening. Not saying it's not going to happen, but it seems to be trending away. Are you aware of that going on in the narrative? No, out there in our- no Glenn, I mean, I, I've heard the same things you've heard, and I've felt some vibes about thing I, I, my stance on this or at least my not my stance my belief over the last six months has been it's the 2008 housing mortgage crisis again the olympics are too big to fail They're too big to fail there's just way too much and if they don't happen everybody and the losses will be massive um, and by the way it's not just financial losses Ten thousand athletes don't get to compete and i have worked and still will be working with somebody in Indianapolis starting Wednesday who was on the 1980 Olympic team. And she has never forgiven Jimmy Carter for that. And now she was on other Olympic teams. So she did have opportunities. She won a medal, but they, and I've had two, two colleagues who've been through this. They tell me how crushed they are for the one timers, the people who, for whom 1980 was the only team that they were going to make and never got a chance to participate. And it's just a scar that is 40 years later is never healed. So when this concept comes up in the Japanese, people don't want the Olympics. I, I got to be honest with you, they don't get a vote. <laughs> they don't get a vote. Um, you know, the politicians and the business people and the health of J- the health professionals in Japan are the ones that are going to have a vote. And I think the only way it doesn't happen is if they just stand up and say, we're shutting the borders. We're just shutting the borders. Can't fly in. 
Uh, and that's going to have to happen pretty quickly because you're going to start having the front lines of people from other countries are going to be going to Japan in the next probably 14 days, the very first front lines. So um, I'm hoping it happens for the athlete's sake because they're all conditioned for the bubble and they'll go and they'll bubble for a week or 10 days, however long, and they'll be okay with it. It's not fun, but that's what they, they've trained five. This is five years now. It's five years. And for the athletes that are older, for whom, you know, that one more year of time, this, these trials that are starting right now in the U.S. are big because you have some older athletes that this, this extra year now could hurt them a lot, right? Because now a younger athlete's a year older and a year more ready to take that spot. And three years from now, they're not going to have enough time to rebound and recover for 2024. So and it's all kinds of, of complications. But ultimately, I know we all talk about the money. And I'm, I'll be honest, having been blessed to be at 11 of them, it's to me, it's about the athletes. If the athletes want to go and compete and are willing to put up with all the bubble stuff, then I'm all for it. Well said, Ted. I, I appreciate that. And I do think you have a good idea for way outside the vines. That's like our, our 2.0 version of this podcast. <laughs> I'm for it. Um, okay. So just a couple quick things before we uh, say goodbye. Cause I, again, I just don't ever really want this thing to end. Ted, thank you for staying up until two o'clock in the morning and, and going straight to the airport. I hope you hey, got How is your bottle yeah. still not empty yeah. by now? Yeah, chug Petit, that thing. Good morning. Petit déjeuner de Paris, breakfast in Paris. <laughs> Margot. <laughs> uh, I got to say thank you to Rasa Vineyards in Walla Walla, Washington. And thank you, Adam Gordon, our producer, who, who picked this yeah. fabulous wine for us. By the way, the backstory I was reading Good about is interesting. Yeah, Adam's the best. But this for this winery, two winemakers left their like safe high-tech jobs to, to start a winery in 2006. And I just, anyone who's willing to, to do that, I have a ton of respect for, and this wine is phenomenal. So thank you for that. Glenn, thank you for making me know more about wine than I ever dreamed yeah. that I would know. Every time Ooh. I listen to you, I learn something new. And Don, you, you know how I feel about you, my man. I, I'm ready for you to take over my spot on this podcast if you want. You've earned it tonight. Well, I feel like I'm pretty good in the middle. Like, I don't know as much about Glenn. Um, You're like I'm the not, Goldilocks. You're just. I don't host either, but I drink. <laughs> a lot of red wine. So I feel like I'm qualified for this. Ash, well, you, know, you know how we'll discourage Don from doing this next week? We tell him, hey, Sauvignon Blanc on the menu. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. I'll be at basketball practice. And I Don, we're, Don I, I, we're going to make this a, a thing. Every time you come to Tucson, anytime we cross paths, mm -hmm. we're going to eat and we're going to order something out of your comfort zone and then we're going to order a cap. Just so you can start expanding and understanding Deal. that there's great wines across the board out there. Really are. That's right. Deal. This is a beautiful Deal. thing that was just born because I know Don's going to be in Tucson quite a bit over the next two years, especially given the news that we heard tonight. So That's congrats right. again, yeah. Don. Yeah, uh, appreciate you guys. And you know who we've got coming up, Ted? Natalie Coglin. Right. Natalie Coughlin. Not that any podcast is ever going to top Don McLean, but Natalie Coughlin may may, uh, may give Don a run for his money. That's going to be our next guest, Natalie. Of course, the Olympic champion, many, many medals, but it's a nice gesture. A woman in the wine business. She yes. and, uh, and a partner of hers own a winery called Guderian. And that's a nice thing to have some women that are making some strides in the wine business. Well, and, and just to put that out there before we go, so I can get ahead of the game. Well, women winemakers have been in the game for a long time. They just haven't been owners. Women right. have a much better sense of smell and their palates are generally better than men. Their memories are incredible. Um, I, I, I actually, I don't know if you're this way and I'm sure Ted, you know, something like this because if you're a wife, but uh, my wife can remember a certain smell and go, oh, you were wearing this on that date when this happened. <laughs> I agree with that, Glenn. And I will say as, as someone who has carried two children, your sense of smell when you are pregnant, like that is actually, you should do the essence tasting oh. if you're a woman when you're pregnant, because unfortunately your, your sense of smell is like through the roof. I would say it's not necessarily a good thing, but yeah, I appreciate that, Glenn. I, uh, yeah, I think women have better taste and smell altogether. <laughs> All right, so Ted, go catch your flight. Don, appreciate you, buddy. Thanks for having me guys. This was fun. Great, Great to be with you. Congrats, Donnie Mac. Thank you, Mac. We'll do it again. Cheers, everybody.